Welcome back one and all to another day, another week here at the Damage Report with me, John Iderola, and my Monday bestie, Francesca Fiorentini. How's it going, Francesca? I'm good. I'm a bestie. <laughs> Do we get those little heart necklaces where it's like BFF, but like broken in half? Yeah, I just, I the amount that I am your bestie is also equal by how selfish I am. So I have that. I just have both parts of it. So yeah, I hope that's. Cool. Typical, typical John. Best but anyway, behavior. exactly. That's just how we are together. Um, but anyway, uh, we are here to launch into a week of news that is already based on stuff that's breaking just before the show starts. Exciting. We're on this really weird run of like acceptable news weeks. Mm. Like not, I'm not saying everything's great or whatever. We got some tough stories, but I don't know. Things are like looking up almost. I don't know, maybe I'm so upside down that it just looks up from this perspective. But anyway, I'm thrilled for the news. Um, but in addition to that, tomorrow we've got the habituation room. What's going on with that? Oh, You're so sweet. Uh, let's see, uh, we're gonna talk about whether rich countries should be paying countries in the global south um, in terms of Climate change, like to yes, I answered uh, save, it. save their some time. Yeah, yes. there we go. Yes, they um, should. But, but we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna talk to someone who leads the effort to basically make that happen on a on a global level. Uh, Esteban Savant is his name, I believe, uh, and it'll be good. So yeah, everybody tune in 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern uh, at Franny Fio on YouTube or Twitch. Thanks so much, John. Tuesdays have been great now. Tuesdays are wonderful. Nice. It's exciting. Your Tuesdays are more exciting, and your Sundays are more actual weekend. So that's yes, good. It's a nice change. Anyway, everybody, thank you for being here. We've got some exciting stuff planned for today and throughout the week. So we're very excited to have you join us. What you can do for us in exchange, in pre exchange, for the awesome stories we're going to be discussing, is you could hit the like button. That would be great. And share the stream so the people know. Blah, blah, algorithm, something, something, it helps. Uh, so please do that. And if you want to send us any comments, tweets, super chats, or anything like that, uh, we will respond as we go. Uh, I do want to acknowledge once again, I know some people are already chatting about it. We are into the regrettable post Sophie period. Sophie has moved on to uh, greener pastures. And no. so that is sad. But we have, you know, another awesome producer who's gonna be coming in just a couple of weeks. We do also want to acknowledge, um, we have you. You don't often hear, you don't often know, but uh, basically all the time, TDR has amazing interns that that help produce the show. Um, not only making sure that I see your messages during the show, but pitching stories and producing stories of their own. And uh, John's been amazing uh, intern. This is his last show as well. Everybody's leaving me. I've got like <laughs> empty nest syndrome coming up soon. But anyway, John, thank you for your service as well. And in fact, John uh, produced uh, one of my favorite stories on the rundown on today's show. That's gonna be very exciting too. Um, people have been asking for us to lighten things up a bit in the aftermath. So we will in fact be doing that with a little news story about Sydney Sweeney. But anyway, <laughs> with that, it gets a little spicy. Polemic. Say that. <laughs> okay, so with that, why don't we jump into uh, our first bit of breaking news of the day? I plan to start off the show breaking down the various ways that Donald Trump has freaked out over the weekend, clearly nervous about this FBI raid. But he went live with a truth this morning that is just, it's really something. It's classic Trump, and it certainly doesn't seem like. Uh, the, the words of a guy who's not at all worried about what legal action might come out of the FBI raid. So he's talking about the Hunter Biden laptop story, which as we all know is the most important story ever and always. Uh, tr true thing, so now it comes out conclusively that the FBI buried the Hunter Biden laptop story before the election. Knowing that if they didn't, Trump would have easily won the 2020 presidential election. This is massive fraud and election interference at a level never seen before in our capital C country. Remedy, declare the rightful winner or, and this would be the minimal solution, declare the 2020 election irreparably compromised and have a new election immediately. And I'm gonna go on a limb and predict that um, I don't think they're gonna do that. I don't think they're gonna give you the presidency. I don't think they're gonna do another election either. But 
Look, if you were worried about whether you would legally be allowed to run in 2024, and I think he's gonna be fine. I think he's going to run, I'm a little bit worried he might win. But coming out of the FBI raid, he might be a little bit worried about that. If you were worried about that, having an election like right now before you can be banned, that certainly would seem appealing, Francesca. Yeah, exactly. Um, why not? Call it, call it right now. Um, I just, I first of all, I, I'm just gonna respond to the fact that you called it. He truthed something. <laughs> I and, know, and I, I, ne- I need you to rescind that. He truthed a thing. Should um, I not have retruthed him? Yeah, Is that don't what you're re- saying? definitely. One point only. Well, I guess it's early, but you know, only like a thousand retruth. So exactly. 1300. Can I just say really fast? I love that like they turned tweet into truth, which they kind of had to do, but they just left the like. You could have at least done love or something. Like you could have tweaked it that two percent, but they they stuck with the like. Yeah, it should just be like very tremendously. I <laughs> tremendously agree. Um. Yeah, just shut up, dude. He needs to shut up about this and wait for things to come out because the affidavit only proved it. Like it did not help him at all. It did not help him one bit. It proved actually the cautiousness, the um, the the methodical way that the FBI went about doing this, and the amount of time they gave him. You got hella time, honey. Like you had so much time to turn over those documents. You didn't turn over the ones they wanted. Twenty-five top secret documents. Top secret documents at Mar-a-Lago, where if you just say that your last name is Musk, you'll get in. Like, what are (laughs) so? Just slow the roll a little bit. Stop drawing attention to it. It's not hitting the way I think he thinks it's gonna hit. Still, well, you're making it sound bad because they're top secret. But I heard some guy who I look. I can't be bothered to learn his name. I'm not 100% sure he'd remember. He's that forgettable. But some guy was on there saying the documents probably never should have been classified in the first place. God, it's it's, <laughs> it's based off of absolutely no evidence. Nope. Look, say we don't know how bad they are. You could say that we don't. We don't know what the actual content is. But to say no, I. I don't think they should have been classified. What the hell are you talking about at this point? You have no idea. But anyway, look, um, I am, I am like you are, uh, waiting for more evidence, and I'm assuming that we're going to be the last people to find out anything more about what's going on, if there is going to be a grand jury, what steps are, and all that. What I assume, though, is that if there is someone who is learning more about some of the legal steps, it would be Trump, I imagine. Like he, his law legal team is making requests to the DOJ. I'm sure some will be coming back to them. So, like I'm looking at his social media, I'm trying to figure out is has anything happened? And and it's sometimes hard to say when, when he truths a third world nation, and that's the whole thing. I don't yeah. know exactly what to make of that. Is that about the VMAs? Is that <laughs> about? Like the second episode of House of the Dragon, I thought it was pretty good, but maybe he thinks we're not producing the best creative output anymore. I mean, anyway, what's ironic? I don't know. What's ironic about him calling Third World Nation, which again, you know, whatever you think of using that term, it's like his presidency really did prove that the kind of corruption that he dabbled in, that he did, was on par with the kind of bald faced corruption we've seen in a lot of countries. That don't have it as baked into the system as we do. See, we have it all, you know, through our dark money and through lobbying. Other countries have it's a little bit more like briefcases and things like this. And so it's like I would argue that actually Trump really had a celebrity being a a former celebrity being like the president. That is a super like so called in heavy quotes banana republic thing, you know. The only problem is that he would have been installed by a foreign entity, or was he? Oh, never know. Anyway, um, I want to give you just a little bit more of what he's been saying. He had this message that he liked so much that he basically retruths it the same morning, saying FBI make America great again. But I thought we were defunding them. I, I'm confused. <laughs> but anyway, the point of the overall message is that the FBI. Under the Comey situation, he hated the FBI because the FBI was the deep state and they were investigating him. But the FBI being Comey and the top level were so bad that other FBI agents went absolutely nuts 
And that was a good thing in the way he's telling it. I don't know what that means. I don't know what the FBI agents going nuts was, but that was the FBI taking back the FBI at that point, except that he hates the FBI now. I thought the nuts FBI agents took it back and that was good. So anyway, he's telling them to once again go nuts. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means put pressure on other agents in the FBI to stop investigations they're doing. I don't know if that's yet another call for violence. We've got some of those coming. I don't know, but but he's confused because he's super complimentary towards the FBI in one message. And then he's he's he started doing this stuff that so reeks of like your really lame uncle's Facebook account. Like he's just doing bad memes yep. of people who for whom graphic design is very much a passion. So there's this, which I guess implies that the FBI is the same as Facebook. Mm. And look, sure, if you want to be concerned about Facebook handing information over to law enforcement, I think that's a legitimate concern to have. But okay, um, and Facebook has helped him so much. It's so many steps of the way, letting him break all of their supposed guidelines on political advertisements and all that. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg yeah. has bent over backwards for them. But like, just like, it, look at look at the meme that he sent out. It's Obama, Comey, and Mueller, so we basically just keep lying. None of those guys are even in this story anymore, man. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Or or this, like, could you invest in a font? Donald J. Trump, American greatness stands with greatness. What does that mean? Are those the two of those Secret Service agents or whatever? And he's standing behind them so they don't see him messing with classified documents. I don't get what you're going for here. Why is but Donald J. Is Trump in? Quotes. Yeah, I don't, that's a great point. I don't. Donald is, it, J. is it him <laughs> or is it not him? I'm not sure. At least, um, fi- wait, hold on. The name of the account who posted it that he retruthed is one family who touched. I don't oh, know what come that on. means, but mm-hmm. I'm not happy about it. <laughs> um, but anyway, and then there's this thing. He he's. He's trying to placate his audience by being fun or whatever. So he sends this out. And so it's make America great again is the only words that were not redacted in this message. But like, do you get the joke? The joke is the FBI had to put out documentation about the unprecedented raid they were apparently forced to target the ex president for. And amongst the many classified documents they recovered, one of them has his catchphrase. You Uh get it? I don't get it. He's not gonna miss the meme train on this. We've seen it. He's gonna be in there. Here's what I love about this very sad attempt at spin. Look, if someone stole my journal and then I kept on being like, what? What's in it? What do you oh you just lying? There's not what? Not it's not crazy at all. What do you mean? What I say? What I say? What I say? I don't know. Like if I were pretending like I didn't know what was in the things that I stole or kept, mm-hmm. like there's only one, there's only two people really who know, right? The FBI, national or you know, the FBI and the National Archives, and then Donald Trump. Yeah. Donald Trump knows what he stole. So Only Donald Trump, if he really wanted to, could reveal what was in the documents. Why don't you say it, bro, bro? Like why he took them. Right. What what is your actual argument for why you took them? Don't lie and say you declassified them. You didn't, but. No, 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 but if you don't think it's a big deal, then what was it? Like, right, are you, let's put put that on you, homie. Like, you don't, don't don't make the FBI reveal it. What was in it? What's, What's so not bad about what you took? Look, as as weird and sad and random and as flailing, man, his truth is just so lame. Don't go on truth. It's just the worst. It's the lamest people. It's just a collection of people self-selected for not understanding comedy and not caring about the law being broken. But anyway, then you get to the fun stuff, which would be the threats of violence, which continue. Let's jump into this video. <laughs> Most Republicans, including me, believes when it comes to Trump, uh, there is no law. If there's a prosecution of Donald Trump for mishandling classified information after the Clinton debacle, which you presided over and did a hell of a good job, there'll be riots in the streets. 
So look, Lindsey Graham had to be our Monday menace because we we just wanted to cruise through a nice weekend, relax a little bit. And here's this guy who a couple years ago was pretending that he was for the rational part of the Republican Party. Now threatening mass violence in the streets if Donald Trump faces the apparently necessary but probably not coming consequences for the laws that he broke. Lindsey Graham is the guy, by the way. Who tweeted, if we nominate Trump, we will get destroyed and we will deserve it in May 2016. It was this last stand of supposed strength. It's his Josh Hawley fist in the air, except there was no strength there. He's a weakling, he's a coward. And as soon as Trump got nominated, suddenly he was his biggest fan. And now he went from calling Trump a, a con man and a bigot that no one should support to saying like no there's going to be violence like if if the FBI <laughs> actually indicts him and we know at this point that he broke the law he had the documents they claim that he did he totally did he had literally hundreds of them we're all just waiting to find out if there will be consequences whether there should be that's done we're way past that we're moving on as a country and now he's saying that there will be violence. And because a senator is saying it, and he didn't imply that that would be terrible. And Trey Gowdy, who was interviewing him, by the way, didn't then respond and oh God, that would be unacceptable. They're all, they're both giving effectively a stamp of approval. It would be okay to do this from their point of view because it sure doesn't seem to bother them, Francesca. No, I mean, this is again, they wanna play with this fire. Haven't we learned enough storming the streets? Uh, who cares about that? What about storming the Capitol? That's the same day that Lindsey Graham was like, enough is enough, Biden won the election. That's not good enough. That's not good enough for the base that you're now, you cultivated, you paved the road for, and now you're scared to death of, right? You're just happy that it wasn't your name they were chanting in terms of you know who to hang. You know, you're just glad you weren't the vice president. Like it's it's an amazing combination, this cocktail of like sycophantry and playing with fire, like fascism and sycophantry. Like it's it's just like you gotta wonder if the road to like the Third Reich and like the rise of Hitler was paved with such amount of like like weird cowardice about the guy that you support. Like it's like you either support this rise to fascism or you don't, but it's kind of this constant like, well, I don't know, I guess people in the streets are gonna get mad. And I guess, well, now we have to lock people up. Oops, now we're gassing people. Like it's just this weird like, like yeah. well, now my family was hauled away in front of me. And yeah, now I should be well, and your hand, your head is in the gallows. And like Lindsey Graham's like, well, what are you gonna do? It it is amazing to me that like people get upset about the semi-fascist remark that Biden made when mm -hmm. like we literally are being marched into yet another whether it's Trump whether it's DeSantis it doesn't matter we're being groomed for fascism here and the Republican party is folding i mean they fold yeah, time and again weird. yeah the, the semi they attacked him for semi-fascism well semi-fascism was what 21 years ago or so mm -hmm. like that's that was fairly semi-fascist um, but no, you have Lindsey Graham who apparently thinks it's fine. By the way, um, you could say it would be wrong, but I think it might happen. It's something that should be considered. And so I'm calling on Donald Trump to stop lying to people about the, the investigation of Mar-a-Lago. Stop lying and pretending that there's no basis for it. Stop getting people to freak out and threaten yeah. you know, the judge, the FBI. Individual people like involved in the case, which by the way, they have been doing. So I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit. I'll remind you, Trump sent that message to Merrick Garland. The country's on fire, what can I do to reduce the heat? That was like weeks ago at this point. Has he been trying to reduce any heat? Has he been trying to get people to be less frothing at the mouth, furious at the deep state, supposedly trying to take him down? No, he hasn't done any of that. And so the judge who signed the warrant, Bruce Reinhardt has been doxxed and threatened. His synagogue had to cancel a service due to the threats that the judge had received. So they're not only going after a judge who didn't do it and apparently was totally right to allow this search because by the way, they had the documents there. But now religious services need to be shut down because of these violent threats. And yet he's doing nothing to reduce the heat. And, and look, honestly, at this point, I know there are some they write, you know, op-eds for the New York Times saying, well, 
they, they could be really unreasonable if there's consequences. So we probably should never have consequences. No, I, I don't say that. I, I tweet over the weekend. Okay, bring it on. If there are going to be riots, let's. Why not finally have the moment that we've all been feeling approaching that the right has been salivating for? That they've been that like dudes named Jim Bob have been running through the woods training for. Let's have that moment now. How about that? Bring it on. If you want to have the riots, if you want to try to take over the country, overthrow the government, let's get it over with now, okay? I want to have a clear next couple of years. We got the Olympics coming up in LA. I want to be able to prep for that. So let's get the civil war out of the way right now, okay? And some people. I don't even know, I, I, I tweeted that out, bring it on. And I got a response from this dude who says, bring it on when Antifa folks armed with milkshakes go up against conservatives armed with ARs, what do you think will happen? And look, in his defense, I don't know if he thinks it's a good idea or not. It's not entirely clear. He also doesn't seem to be saying what he thinks he's saying because he thinks the Antifa people are bad, but he's admitting that they only have milkshakes. So I guess they're not that bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's say that I accept every premise in your message. Uh, then I guess the conservatives would just truly horribly murder some people and then get gunned down. And then a bunch of people go to jail and it would be a national tragedy. And then it would be over and then we would move on. It would be terrible. I don't know why you'd wanna be on the side of that, that, that brief disgusting stain on our history of people who might be affiliated with you politically. Uh, killing innocent people to protect a billionaire who definitely did the crimes. I don't know why you'd want to be on that side, um, but they're not going. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to gun down some Antifa, and then uh, Trump is president again. That's what'll happen. They'll kill a bunch of people, and then Trump will be president, and that will be awesome. And then we'll just continue on with America, I guess. I think that's probably not what's going to happen. But Francesca, what do you think? I mean, you know, look, I get it. Like, uh, wanting to get this over with. You know, I'm about to bring a new life into the world. I'm like, do civil war mm-hmm. now. You know what I'm saying? I'll hide. It'll be chill. Um, get get your yayas out. You know, as you're practicing in the backwoods. But yeah, it it is. It's your your. You know, you. It's at once funny, but also incredibly terrifying and scary. And I do feel like mainstream news, uh, and generally those who love to just like rubberneck uh, violence do want that moment. Like like January 6 yeah. was terrifying and awful for everyone and, and none the least our democracy and our democratic process. But the media loved it. And in terms of the way the media responds to like the violence, you can feel it, right? It's not only that they're afraid, they like to be afraid of the base. They're like, ooh, what if they do do something? Mm, Then we could cover it and then we just have like endless 24 hour coverage and it'll be really good. I mean, it's terrible for the country, but it's good for my pocketbook. And I I have to say that because it, it is scary the way we would rather focus on like, right wing militias and what's Trump's base gonna do versus like the massive amount of union drives that are going on in this country, unprecedented, right? The people who are unionizing all over the country. And and like, nah, that's boring. No, we don't wanna talk about the Amazon warehouse that's unionizing now. No, 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 let's talk about like, ooh, let's talk about like the Trumpers and like the crazies. So like, I just wanna name sure. that like our media is so focused on hoping that there's some kind of violence. Um, but you're right, that here's the question is, depending on who's in power is how much they'll get gunned down, right? Like you saw what happened on January 6. I do believe, you know, like it, it was a transition moment. I don't know if mm. it would have been as they would have gotten as far if it were now. Yeah, I, I want to be clear. I, I was being sarcastic. Yes. I, I don't want. I don't want mass murder in the streets. <laughs> as a general rule for this situation, but you can also just carry that forward unless I say otherwise. I don't want mass murder in the streets. But John, we've had it, we've had it, right? We had not just January 6th, we had the Unite the Right rally, which was a moment which was like, oh man, we are, we're the baddies, we're the, we look crazy with our shields and, you know, uh, swastikas or whatever. Um, And we killed someone. Uh oh, like, you know, there's been all these sort of coming out parties, and I feel like January 6th was also one of them. And they all go back into the holes and they realize that they're not they're not leading with their best foot forward. And yet the Republican Party keeps on trying to legitimize their violence. They're like, okay, guys, when we do the next semi-civil war, you know, yes. instance, don't be as nuts. Don't bring the shields. You know what I mean? 
And and that's what the Lindsey Grahams are doing. That's what the people in office are doing. Yeah, I agree. Right. Okay, Um. Oh, we're, I think we're gonna have to wait for Mark Levin for tomorrow. So we're gonna take a short break. When we come back, I wanna talk more about student debt cancellation, including the fact that although it's been a couple, a week and a half now, uh, the right is still absolutely losing their minds. And they are fighting with each other to demonstrate how out of touch they are and how much they hate American workers. So we're gonna run through some of the most fun examples after this. Okay, everybody, let's get constructive briefly before we spend a bit more time mocking the right. So let's start off with this. We are fresh off Joe Biden's student debt cancellation plan, and it's going to help a lot of people. Something like 40 million people will get some amount of cancellation. Over 10 million will have their entire student debt vanish, and that is great. But there's obviously still a lot more that can be done. And there is the sort of seductive allure of complacency. We already won, so do we really need to push? Well, some are already pushing back against that almost preemptively, including Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who sent an email over the weekend to her supporters saying this. It is now up to us and to you to decide if we are going to stop here or if we're going to keep pushing. I'm very grateful for this watershed moment of a first step. It is encouraging, thrilling, and has already changed so many people's lives. But I'm also thinking about how this still leaves a question mark for those in the highest amounts of debt who need the most amount of help. Remember that the Biden administration didn't want to do this at all. It was your pushing, your pressure, your organizing that got them to this point. They have forgiven far, far more debt for business owners in the form of PPP loans who didn't meet any sort of income requirements or means testing for almost $1 trillion in forgiveness. And mm -hmm. here is where it gets interesting. She has sort of an idea of what we could do as a next step for cancellation. She says, mind you, forgiving all student debt in the US is about $1.7 trillion. You could undo the 2017 tax cuts for the 1% and forgive all student loans, plus have money left over to contribute to universal childcare, tuition free college, homelessness, etc. And because I know the right would love to find an opportunity where they could say that she was wrong and dumb and stupid and a woman, um, she is a woman, I checked, uh, but no, she's not wrong. The numbers do check out. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act signed into law by Trump back in 2017 is projected to cost around $1.9 trillion over a decade. Total US student loan debt is currently around $1.75 trillion. So you could do that. You could get rid of all the student debt and then pay for four years of free public college for the entire country for two or three years. What a deal, and all you lose is tax cuts that went to the richest people in the history of people. Yep. Francesca, what do you think? I mean, just incredible, like that that we're stuck with that tax break, those tax cuts for the wealthy for another, you know, whatever it is, seven years. Um, but I think AOC is absolutely right to bring this up. The numbers line up. Um, the tax breaks to the wealthy are even more expensive than actually canceling all student debt. And if nothing else, it's an important exercise for us to imagine, right? Like it's important mm -hmm. to put out a vision. It's important to actually like say the thing that maybe we, you know, it's like, no, we can't, we can't undo that. It's like, why not? Why wouldn't? Let's look into it. And let me just say, one of the things that was in that 1.9 trillion dollar tax break for the wealthy was the ability between 2017 and 2026 to write off the whole cost of a private jet. That's right, I did a uh. story when Kylie Jenner was taking those short flights and we talked about Elon Musk taking those short flights and every other celebrity that are something like 60 to $70 million is how much those jets cost. They are completely like tax free, like you can write them off your taxes completely. Yeah. And and that's into and that was deliberately written into that 2017 tax break for the wealthy. So not only is it costing us in terms of you know our taxpayer money and our tax base, but it's also costing us in terms of like carbon emission and the mm. future of the planet in so many ways. The you you could argue that rescinding that tax break wouldn't just help, let's say, students, but it would help all of us. The the less wealth hoarding you have. In this country and around the world, the better things are for the planet, for democracy, for you know the economy generally, for our own survival. Like you could argue, you're giving this break to the worst people, the people who obviously deserve it the least. Yeah, yeah, 100%.
You're being a little bit unfair when you you pitch it as the tax break loophole on the jets for rich people. I mean, if a student bought a private jet, they would be able to write it off too. So it's equitable True. in that way. It applies to yeah. literally everyone. Anyone can um, buy one. But yeah, a hundred percent. And and again, like all of the tears, and we're gonna spotlight some in just a moment about like a couple hundred billion dollars in cancellation. It was one point nine trillion dollars out the door. People didn't want it, it's not popular, it's obviously not helping the economy. And they only do it, to be fair, every time a Republican wins the presidency. So, yep. and that'll be true for the rest of your life, by the way. If a Republican gets in, they don't often do much because they've already won this game. There's not much you need to do when you've won, um, but they'll take more money. They will take more money, and I mean literally, not just figuratively. They will take more money from you and from the government. So get ready for that. Uh, but yeah, no, I would I would love to see some next steps, uh, including things like there's all this great stuff beyond just the cancellation, like the fact that now after 10 years of payments, if you have below $12,000 of uh, original debt, it wipes out the rest, that sort of thing. What I would say is, um, why is that $12,000? If it's 12,000, could it not be 15,000? Yeah. Could it not be 20,000 or 30,000? I mean, then you're still locking people into 10 years of debt payment. And then maybe we get rid of it. Is can we debate where exactly that line should be? I think that we can do that as a country. Okay, with that, I do want to have some fun on this topic, though. So we've got three people to spotlight. We do need to go relatively quickly through these. No major rants or anything, even though some of them will infuriate you. Um, but with that said, why don't we jump directly into uh, Ted Cruz? Ted Cruz wants to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is out of, so out of touch, so uncool, simultaneously. That no one would ever want to support him. Now, you probably already know this, but take a look at this clip. He's going to reach a whole new audience with this. That there is a real risk if if you are that that slacker barista who 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 wasted seven years in college studying completely useless things, now has loans and can't get a job. Joe Biden just gave you twenty grand. Like holy cow, twenty grand that. You know, maybe you weren't going to vote in November and suddenly you just got 20 grand. And, you know, if you can, you know, get off the bong for a minute and, and, and head down to the voting station uh, or just send in your mail in uh, ballot that the Democrats have helpfully sent you, um, it could drive up turnout, hmm. uh, particularly among young people. Okay, so uh, Ted Cruz is absolutely awful there. Terrible. We'll spotlight why. But to be clear, he's not actually the lamest person in that video because after he does this thing about getting off the bong like it's 1941 or something, uh, they then cut to a wide shot so you can see the host of the podcast, Michael Knowles, who gives this creepy, sycophantic little grin. If we could go to this shot where he is so thrilled to have Ted Cruz mocking the idea that one of these people who works a full time job. Might do legal drugs. <laughs> that guy's what? Like he couldn't be more than mid 30s or something. He's 90. Inside, inside his crusty black heart, he's 90. But anyway, Ted Cruz <laughs> is saying that um, it doesn't matter if you work, it doesn't matter if you grind out a living. If you're doing something that I don't value, something stupid like making coffee, one of the most popular products in our entire country. Then you don't deserve respect. You certainly don't deserve government action to help you. Even if you're grinding out, getting to work at 5 a.m. so that people can show up for their 6 a.m. coffee, you don't deserve any help because all you're doing is working, sweating, toiling to produce products that people want. And this is now a through line for the Republican Party. They hate basically anyone who makes a drink. So if you make coffee, if you're a barista as I was in college, screw you, you're worthless. Mm -hmm. Marjorie Green has multiple times suggested that AOC can't be smart because she was a bartender. I don't know what that means. These are both very hardworking professions. But if you're one of those people, you can be a Republican, that's your right. Why you would be, I have no idea because they don't respect you at all. This is the party that calls themselves populist, that, that rails about the elite. And then now they're crapping all over someone who's a barista, who's like working a job. I mean, just it's it at that the dissonance obviously once again is so insane. And of course, like the people who they're speaking to, I mean, again, at the end of the day, yeah, there's some stragglers who are like working class folks, but it, it is again people who like are like boat dads and like you know just middle upper middle class dudes. Um, 
And that's who their base is. So let's not like every time we get deluded about like, oh, the working class. No, no, no. They don't have a handle on the working class. They have no idea what it's like if they were, if it were like, you know, tomorrow morning and all the baristas disappeared, which by the way, if you really were populist, you would show your solidarity with Starbucks baristas who are currently trying to unionize against Howard Schultz. Yes. Who is a Democrat, by the way. If you want to find an angle to hit him, but no, 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 they, they they can't be bothered for that. That's 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 too much solidarity for them. Working class solidarity. They just want to use it in talking points. But yeah, it's uh, I don't know. That barista sounds dope. I want to hang out with him. <laughs> uh, I haven't hit a bong in many many years. But honestly, I feel like if we keep the House and the Senate, I'll hit a bong. I'll hit a standing just, bong, dude. They they seem to think that their entire job is making their side look so unfun. So lame. So unfun. They don't <laughs> like comedy. They don't want you to have fun. They want to ban porn. They don't, they want to have personal control over your bodies. Like, why would you want to be on that side? I don't know. I don't know why you would say these things. I, presumably, like when I think about what's likely to come from it, I imagine Ted Cruz wanted to make sure that he never, for the rest of his life, had coffee that didn't have spit in it, and this is the most efficient way to go about that. I suppose. Yep. Sorry, spit. Best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Best case scenario, spit. Anyway, um, yeah, and, and by the way, uh, if you, like I worked as a barista, you know who couldn't do a full shift at a busy college as a barista? Ted freaking Cruz. It gets a yeah. little bit cold, he runs to Cancun. Um, so that's a slacker. <laughs> if you get $20,000 off of that, you're a slacker. If you're a billionaire who suddenly like hundreds of thousands of dollars of your taxes just evaporate, you don't have to pay them anymore. And you're just making passive income off your investments. You're a hardworking American. That's what I'm learning from them. Why don't we move to something arguably weirder, if not as condescending? I don't know. We'll we'll debate it, but let's jump into this video of uh, Lauren Boeber. Uh, how the heck can Joe Biden call America First conservatives a threat to democracy with a straight face and a dry diaper? He's the one who has allowed millions to invade our southern border. He's the one who is robbing hardworking Americans to pay for Karen's daughter's degree in lesbian dance theory. Okay, so we're gonna return to the lesbian dance theory because I feel like we're obligated to. But I, she wanted to have her line about Biden wearing a diaper, which I don't know, he's old enough, it's possible. But even she says that it's dry, like she's giving him credit. Like sure, he's wearing a diaper, but apparently just in case, because he's keeping it together, it's not yeah. a wet diaper. But anyway, it um, is really the main difference between Trump and Biden. You know, I mean, like our audience knows, it's wet versus dry diaper. That's and all yes, it is. And yes, all we're going with dry diaper. The lesser of two evils is <laughs> the dry diaper. Vote dry diaper, 2024. <laughs> but anyway, the main point she was making, if she's making any point is that student debt should not be canceled. Why? Because she doesn't respect the thing, the the degrees that people get. Now, of course, as you all know, like you are allowed to get whatever degree you want. The idea that they can just say that studying certain types of thing has no merit whatsoever. Well, that's that's very interesting coming from Lauren Boebert, particularly looking at her record in terms of education. But anyway, um, uh, I, I look. There's. I, I went for engineering, ended up getting a poli sci degree. You can you can respect that or not if you want. People go for all sorts of different things, okay? But the idea that everyone who went to college went to get a degree in lesbian dance theory is not statistically true. It sounds cool. Imagine the country we'd have if everyone had a proper respect for lesbian dance theory. Um, but being I, opposed I have to, to say, like I, I. To have a degree in lesbian dance theory, mm-hmm. um, my actual degree is truly not a, not far off from that. Less on the dance, heavier on the lesbian, I would say. <laughs> but that's the point of college; it's to learn. Can we understand that the anti-intellectual assault from the right is only to create more pliable worker bees for their factories in which they underpay you and don't allow you to unionize or ever get ahead or ever be able to even meet the the needs of your family or your communities. That is the only reason they hate on college 
also they're independently wealthy, right? So they want to say, "Oh, go to school as a doctor, go to school as a, you know, or even get your business degree." Yeah. Doctors, nurses, people with business degrees also have massive amounts of debt. So even when you go into so-called respectable professions, which by the way, they don't respect nurses and doctors. No, they not don't at all. respect them at all. Right? You spend years saying that a pandemic doesn't exist. You don't let nurses, you don't love when nurses try to unionize. You don't respect any of that stuff. So who what is this if you're a wolf of Wall Street, if you're Leonardo DiCaprio in the year like 1999 to 2002, I don't know, like who are we talking about here? If you're it's a always, finance it's gonna, bro. It's whoever it needs to be. The point of her comment is not to express an actual understanding of student debt. She doesn't understand student debt any more than she understands college. It was to say money isn't supposed to go to the working class. And also, I hate the LGBTQ community. She wanted to make sure that you understood. It's not enough to say you shouldn't get a degree in gender studies. Now it's specifically lesbian dance, which I, I don't know if that's a thing. I imagine classes in it are gonna be pretty popular coming out of this Lauren Boebert thing. But anyway, that's what she wanted to communicate. And with that, we do have to move to, again, maybe someone even more out of touch than Ted Cruz. Take a look at Marco Rubio. Let's start with this. I talked about the fact we need to reform student loans. I owed over $100,000 in student loans. The day I got elected to the Senate, I had over $100,000 still in student loans that I was able to pay off because I wrote a book. And from that money, I was able to pay it. If not, I would never, I'd still be paying it, okay? So that's not about, I, I think the student loan thing in America is a big problem and it's broken and it needs to be fixed and it needs to be reformed. Okay, uh, don't have your debt canceled, just become a senator and get a big advance on a book. Sounds like stupid advice, <laughs> but you should understand that apparently the question he was answering was, can you be a successful politician and tell people to pull themselves up by the bootstraps? And he did answer the question, uh, no, you apparently cannot do that without looking like an absolute doink. Um, although as Shuley pointed out, technically he pulled himself up by his bookstraps, which is true. Now the idea that you should just write a book and get a massive advance is ridiculous enough. But it does give us an opportunity to remind you that the entire thing of politicians and commentators in politics generally writing books is ripe with corruption. It is ridiculous and it is corrupt. Um, his book, by the way, Marco Rubio, back in 2013, he published An American Son, a memoir. He got an $800,000 book advance. Jesus. And I want to ask you a question Have you ever met a person who has read that book? No, you have not. I'll answer that for you. Why do they get these big advances? Why do these books serve as uh, bestsellers? When nobody ever reads them, well, we have some videos up on the channel. I did a multi-part series breaking down Don Trump Jr. and his scam. They they basically use nonprofits on the right to buy up a bunch of their books in massive quantities to simulate demand for it. And there is even a special symbol on the New York Times bestseller to mark when this is done. It's a little That's dagger. Hard. You can go right now and you can see it in a number of books. When a political commentator on the right has a book that goes bestseller, unless it's like Glenn Beck, it's like 90% chance that it's all a fiction. They're not bestsellers. Nobody's reading these books. They're bought up in mass quantities and then they're thrown into the dump. That's what it is. It happened for Marco Rubio. And if it could happen for every student, I'd be in for it. I just don't think that's how it's gonna work. Also, whoever owns Hudson News is a raging Republican donor POS. Like that person <laughs> absolutely hates, I mean, they hate all travelers, really. Because have you ever been like stuck? I would not read Marco Rubio's book if I were stuck in a layover for a week. And it was the only thing on display at Hudson. Okay, I would probably, but I would like live stream it and we'd make jokes and be funny. But you should watch those videos. This is like John Iderola's John Oliver moment. That is very important to remember. You can just, you can buy off the New York Times bestseller list. <gasps> Clutches non existent pearls. Yeah, yeah and, and you might ask, by the way, watch those videos. They're up on the channel, and I think we did a pretty good job. Why, why do this? Well, do you know how nice it is to be able to say, I'm a New York Times bestseller? All yeah. of them do it. All of, nobody reads their books, but they, it is a way to literally take a certain amount of money and turn it into an aura of respectability. That's all it is, and it's totally legal. You can totally do it, and the New York Times is complicit in this. 
They have the symbol because they know it's a con. What you could do is not listed as a bestseller. How about that? That's a hell of a symbol for you. Where do those books Why not land? Actually, what's that? Where do the books land? Like, do they land in the same place that the like the people? Yeah, or like you know, rural con- rural communities in like Uganda, where where like the T-shirts of like you know, uh, uh, teams that don't win the pennant cup. You know what I mean, like that, or Probably the Stanley that. Cup, or you know what I mean, like it's like that and Marco Rubio's, or just like as the students of Florida who are like they can only read right wingers memoirs. <laughs> like exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, John. Well, Funny to no, me. It's, it's cool. I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, something needs to be done about it, but it's still, we did those videos like two years ago. It's still a, any number of right wing bestsellers since then. Anyway, but with John, that said, we do have to take our last break. Okay, super fast. Super We're fast. Really you, have to be, you have to be a right winger in order to write the right book. Remember how Bernie Sanders wrote a book and they were like, how dare you make money from that book? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I bought his book, by the way. That was an authentic sale. Anyway, with that said, we do have to take our last break of the hour. When we come back, we need to touch base with the absolute epidemic of gun violence that happened over the weekend. We'll be back with that and more after this. Okay, there's no time to waste, let's jump right into it. There's been a lot of good news happening throughout the country over the last few weeks, but we do have to remember that the bad parts of America continue and gun violence is just one of those things that we cannot seem to shake. I wanna give you a brief overview, a brief tour of just some of the acts of gun violence over the past couple of days. Horrific instances like in Oregon, two people were killed in a shooting at a shopping center, apparently happened at a grocery store. Uh, So law enforcement agencies flooded the area, entering the grocery store. The gunman apparently was dead from a gunshot wound. Apparently there was an AR-15 style rifle and a shotgun near him. They say that they didn't fire at him, implying that he killed himself. But someone was able to get these guns, went to a mall, killed multiple people. It's news right now. Will it be news in a day or two? I don't know. It's affected that community for you know the rest of their lives the the people who are lost their li- their friends their family members and in Houston there was an absolute horrendous shooting at an apartment building a guy shot five tenants at this building killing three of them apparently set a fire to lure people out <laughs> he was eventually shot but the guy also was shooting at firefighters battling the fire so I can't imagine this being worse. But you also have here in California, three people hospitalized after a shooting outside of a Sikh temple. Apparently three Sikh individuals at that temple had been shot. There was in Fort Worth, Texas, a five year old boy and a 17 year old boy were gunned down in a drive by shooting. A toddler was injured as well. And all the way over in Coney Island Beach, there was a shooting that left one person dead and four stable. And for each of these instances that we're citing, God only knows how many that we missed. No disrespect intended. How could anyone log all of the acts of gun violence happening throughout our country every day, Francesca? Oh, I think it's really important that we remind folks. And I think it's important we do these stories because you know we only pay attention when we collect them all together and they happen to be children. It's only the most egregious mm. and heinous instances. But no, this is every damn day. It is easier to get a gun in this country than it is to vote. That is the simple and sad fact. And the only difference that this nation has with every other country in the world is that of there are too many guns and it's way too easy to get our hands on them. Why can't we join the rest of the world and actually keep people alive? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what would be lost? I mean, we know we can, we can limit things. We know we can. And we're in the aftermath. We're going to be talking about one ridiculous thing that has now been limited in New York State. We can do that. Countries throughout the world have done it. I would love to hear what it is that they've apparently lost, what core part of their political soul they've lost by making it so that you can't routinely commit acts like this. But we're just, we're gonna have this until we finally act. And when we finally do, we'll know that many, many people needlessly died as we waited to finally do something. Anyway, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for the first hour of the damage war. Thank you everyone on the linear platforms of the podcast for joining us. But if you're on the other platforms, There is still more to come in the aftermath, some amazing stories, some funny stories too. So don't go anywhere, Francesca and I'll be back after this.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.